The picture that you have just seen is a photograph of the late Sarah Hunter uh, of Manchester, Vermont. Sarah Hunter was a golf pro at Manchester Country Club, and she disappeared on September 18th of 1986, and her body was found uh, November 27th, 1986, about two months later. My guest for this special edition of Q&A Live is Dwayne Carlton from West Rutland, Vermont. And many of you may remember Dwayne as a repeat guest on my show. He is a musician, a singer, songwriter, uh, employs himself in playing music all around Vermont, New England, uh, been writing songs and producing albums for three decades or longer, uh, while doing a show in Manchester, Vermont, he learned of the disappearance of Sarah Hunter and decided to do a documentary film about that occasion. Uh, Dwayne, welcome back to Q&A Live. Thank you, Bob. It's great to have you here again. Uh, a little different capacity. Last couple of times you've been on my show, we've uh, talked about your musical career and we played a little music together. Uh, but we're here for a much different reason. Uh, about four years ago or so, uh, as I understand it, you were playing in Manchester and uh, you learned of the disappearance of Sarah Hunter. And anybody that's lived around here, of course, have knew of the disappearance. Uh, and the only difference between you and everybody else in the world is that you decided to uh, do something about it. And you have produced and filmed uh, and are about to release on September 18th on the anniversary of her disappearance um, a, a documentary that you've done. Um, I've had a chance to see excerpts of the film and uh, you, you, I will say before you even get a chance to speak that you, uh, you, you've done a remarkable job in the film. You've done a remarkable service uh, to Sarah Hunter and her family. So, um, again, welcome back to Q&A Live and let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, why, why, how, how'd you get into this? You were, you were doing a show at uh, Maxwell's Flat Road, which is no longer here. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for saying those kind words. Um, I was playing at Maxwell's and uh, this one particular evening I, I got there early and uh, so I, I was set up before I actually had to start playing and had a little time to kill. And right across the street from Maxwell's, there was uh, uh, like the ruins of a, of a building, which I, to me just struck me so very out of place right in the middle of, of Manchester, you know. <coughs> and that stuff kind of, you know, interests me. So I, I went and I kind of poked around and looked at it and went back in and asked some of my, um, you know, uh, local friends. I said, you know, hey, what's the deal with that? And they started to tell me how it had been a hotel and a bar and somebody had been shot there and Harry the Hat yes Harry the Hat exactly and um, I was kind of taken aback because my you know as somebody that doesn't live here you know that my impression of Manchester it was that, you know this is the kind of place where that would never ever happen which I said to these folks and they said oh no no we've we've had a couple of murders here in Manchester and then they proceeded to tell me about the disappearance of Sarah Hunter. And that was actually a couple of years before I started to work on the film. A couple of, year, a couple of years later, you know, I'd been in a position where I had, um, you know, I've pretty much focused on my music career nonstop for the better part of three plus decades. And you know, uh, you know how they say that everybody's got to have a hobby. Well, I, I as <laughs> you know, kind of on the side, I was. I was. My really wife thinks my music is a hobby. Is yeah. a hobby, right? <laughs> and you know, and that's the thing. You know, the thing for me, the music was just this. You know, every second of every day. And so I, you know, I had this interest in film, and you know, I was I was a kid who grew up on TV and you know movies, and so um, I had an interest in it. And I had done some videos for myself, and so uh, I had it. Music videos. Yeah, presumably. music videos, yeah. 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 And I had, had it in my head that uh, hey, it'd be kind of interesting to maybe get into making, you know, try to make a movie, you know, go from the three or four minute video to 
a full-length feature, you know, and I thought, yeah, wow. I'm very interested in documentaries. And initially, I started out with with a friend of mine who was also kind of at the same point with, you know, his career. He was like, you know, he kind of needed something else to do too. And uh, and for some for some reason, this popped back into my head. And maybe it, I, I, it was because it was so mysterious. I mean, when people talked about this story, it was about the mystery, you know, how creepy the the parts of the story that were known to the pub public were and there wasn't much known to the public no, and that true. made it all that much more mysterious so I uh, decided well yeah you know we talked about it and thought hey wouldn't this be cool to hey let's make a film about that and, so this you is know, you and a friend of yours yes my friend Tom yes and we decided yeah we'll we'll give this let's let's you know, wouldn't it be cool to be able to figure out who did it? And wouldn't it be sure. cool to, you know. Yeah. Well, it's all a mystery. Never, ever really thinking that. But, you know, it was kind of like that, like you are when you're a little kid. Hey, you know, here's a mystery. Let's go solve it, you know. And uh, subsequently, we, s you know, I, I made the investment on uh, the equipment. And we started. So you went out and bought a video camera. Oh, yeah. You bought gear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, guess that's I, what a hobby is. You go out and buy, yeah, the, well, go buy the train set, and then isn't you start that great buying the cars. That, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I wanted a hobby, and well, I better go out and buy a, you know thousands of dollars worth of equipment. To oh do my god! <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. No, I, I went in all the way because I you know I, I wanted it, I didn't want it to look amateurish. You know, I wanted it to look like a you know a real film, and I was already aware that a big problem with uh, indie films is is audio. You know, a lot of times filmmakers are not kind of cued in on making the audio sound good but being a musician I was like oh you know I'm yeah, already cued into that you're all about sound right and um, so I was more about I need to pay attention to making it look good you know and uh, so yeah made that investment and and started working on it and you know not too long into it my feeling you know the the, the mystery kind of intrigue part of it became less of the reason to pursue it because f not too long into it as soon as we started finding out what kind of person Sarah Hunter was you know that here was this person that was a sincerely good and kind human being you know who was doing great things for her community you know doing these junior golf programs mm -hmm. and was an incredibly talented golfer you know for a woman to become you know, the first, you know, head golf pro at the Manchester Country Club. I mean, that's that's no small feat in 1986, you right. know what I mean? Yeah, she yeah. was... Very special. Uh, yes, exactly. And uh, th for some reason, that uh, made an impact on me. And, and I began to think about, uh, well, you know, what if this was m my sister? You know, because, yeah. you know, yeah. I have a sister, and if if... God forbid something this tragic and horrific had happened to my sister. I, I would never be able to let it go until I, I found the answer. Right. You know, and um, I don't know, I just seem to connect on that level. That this, that, that this, it, that it seemed like the focus was on how she died and the mystery of As her. opposed to who she as was. As and opposed what kind to, of, what kind of a person she you was. know, he, this, this was a, a human being and a good human being and she, you know, in no way deserved what happened to her, had it coming in any way. It was just complete tragedy. And then uh, the other part of it was that when I s started researching uh, um, the story, finding out that there were other towns involved, that it was not only Manchester, but then she was found in Paulette. You know, right. my, my wife grew up in Paulette. I have a lot of friends in Paulette. And all of a sudden I was like, wow. You know, Close that's to home. and that's a big deal. There's something like that it had to everybody had to have known about it, been talking about it, um, and then also that you know her purse w had been found in in Danby, in Danby right. you know, and I of course knew a lot of people in Danby as well. So what I discovered is that this thing it wasn't just like well this happened to this person and a few people were affected. This was like someone dropping the atomic bomb on Southern Vermont because it just went outwards, you know. I mean, there were women in Manchester, Paulet, Danby, terrified. You know, I, I talked to people, uh, to, to, to women that were saying, 
when I got a, out of work in Manchester, I was afraid to walk across the parking lot to my car. You know, we locked our doors at night. You know, th things like that. And I realized, wow, this had a huge impact on a lot of people, and a lot of people that I knew. Uh, yeah, you they know, did. including yourself. I mean, yeah. you were a longtime resident. Yeah. You know, um, I should probably point out that uh, I was interviewed for for your film, uh, just for some background. Well, because because you have been a lifelong resident of Manchester, you were here at the time, and um, I knew that you would be able to provide that perspective of how the town was affected. That um, you know, uh, you know, like I said before, this this doesn't happen here, and you actually say that in the film that that was how everybody felt. This this kind of thing doesn't happen yeah. here. Yeah. You know, this is you know we we live in Vermont because it's safe. There's low crime. You know, people feel you know you know your neighbors, and and to have something like this happen where all the, and there was no clue at the time of. Who could have done this? Who could have possibly done it? So, you know, and that, of course, in a small town, that's part of the story, too, is that then the rumor mill just went crazy. You know, people would be like, was it that guy? Is it this guy? It must be that guy. That guy's a little strange. You know, or, you everybody, know? anybody who was uh, slightly out of the ordinary right. was, was looked at. For right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, w you've actually put together a trailer that we would like to uh, uh, show here on our show. And so, ladies and gentlemen at home, if you would uh, bear with us for just a few minutes, um, I'd like to go to the trailer, and uh, you can actually get a glimpse of the movie that will be released on September 18th of this year in West Rutland, Vermont. So stay tuned, and uh, we'll be back in just a second. Mm. person who came in to open up the, um, the sitco for the day uh, saw the car and notified the police and the police determined that it was her car and as of that time she was missing. The creepy thing about all this was the way the car was handled. The car was stuffed into a concrete bunker type area. When we found the purse next to a rock wall and there was a fallen down tree next to it on the side of the road. I was pretty sure when they found that purse that that poor girl was killed. And that was horrible. I just, I was so upset and I still, I'm still upset thinking about it now. The Herald had received a tip or some information that a body had been found in Pollitt. And immediately he said this could be Sarah Hunter because she was missing from the general area. And there was a collective oh my God, in this community, it, you know, it was, this doesn't happen here. You now had a situation where your neighbor became unwillingly involved. It was a, a person who lived in town that located the body and, and, and that's, that makes it just all that much more too real. Jeez, how do you get from, how do you get from a missing car and not showing up to work to finding the body in the field, you know, that's such a, I don't know, how do you, how do you well, solve things like that? Should this ever be solved? Should it be determined who did this and how and why and all, well, you may never find the why, but if, if it ever came to an end, an appropriate end, then there's no question that people would go back to remembering her for who she was and how she lived and all of that. Right now, she's still the mystery, the mystery death of Manchester. But should that be solved, I think people would then focus on the positive attributes that she gave to this community. The focus was on, on one particular individual. Um, there's strong 
suspicions that this person was somehow involved. Uh, he worked at uh, the Lehigh in uh, Manchester, which would have, you know, put him in um, the village area uh, at the time in question. He fled the area um, and and uh, basically just vanished. Once I found out he left us, left the area. Uh, what was the big reason why he had to leave? And there was a police chase. Uh, where he was finally uh, caught, I think, in Oceanside, um, California. Um, but it was, it, it was essentially uh, an abduction and uh, attempt, attempted um, sexual assault. The proposal, um, w w which was that he would talk about Vermont in exchange for uh, bring, being brought back here. Now, we all assumed... Um, that talking about Vermont meant talking about Sarah Hunter. Um, but that wasn't done. I mean, that didn't happen. Unfortunately, it was the times. And, and that's a horrible answer, uh, especially for the victim and the victim's family. I, th I think that once we get to the point where uh, we look at uh, the investigative material, the evidence, uh, the profile, uh, characteristics, traits, suggested background, and then we look at uh, uh, David Morrison's background. We compare him to the characteristics that are described. Um, I, I think you have to, to arrive at a point uh, where you say that the likelihood of, of there being some connection between David Morrison and, and the murder of uh, Sarah Hunter is extremely high. That's a very powerful trailer. Thank you. Uh, it's a very powerful film. Um, uh, it's the story of Manchester losing one of its own. Um, my guess is, as a working musician uh, who had never, this is your first documentary. This is my first documentary, yes. Um, much like picking up a guitar for the first time and going, well, it only has six strings, how hard can this be? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and learning uh, every time you pick that up and, and play it, uh, that you pick up more each time you do it. Uh, I'm going to guess it's safe to say that you started this project with a frame of reference, a subject, idea of what you're going to do, but after, I mean, you've worked on this, Dwayne, for four years. This has been a, almost a life's work undertaking. <laughs> uh, uh, that there had to be some uh, education for Dwayne Carlton along the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was an education, Bob. Uh, the, the thing, you know, I learned a vast amount about not only myself, it was an incredible learning experience in that regard, you know, and personal growth and, you know, life sure. lessons. I mean, I learned a lot about the equipment, you know, the software for, you know, editing and... Uh, you have edited it, edited this film yourself? Yeah, I did all the editing. You did all the editing. All the editing, the, the soundtracking, which was the part that was the easiest for me, uh, you know, obviously. You did that too? I, mean, I did, yeah. So and this is a complete undertaking. I mean, you haven't farmed any of this out? No. Wow. No, from from That's start to finish, and and basically. Well, here at GNA TV Studios, uh, uh, everybody that works here will appreciate what I'm undertaking. That yeah. just that component, just that piece. Is I mean, I've spent basically the last year and a half was just editing. Wow. You know, I mean, it was very lengthy, and uh, um, you know, and the the partner that I started with basically within the first year had, you know, just kind of faded out of the project. And at that point... Decided it was your hobby and not his? Pretty much. <laughs> you know, I don't think he quite had the, the passion for it as I did. You know, and, uh, to, to be honest, uh, you know, um, I'm kind of this way with my music, too. I mean, I'm probably, 
you know, there, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I was undiagnosed obsessive compulsive because I, I would married. diagnose you as that actually. <laughs> See, and you know me pretty well, <laughs> and I know so, you pretty well, and so. I'm not offended by you saying that. But it's you know, I get very, you know, when when I, when something trips my trigger, I mean, I get very focused, and 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 this, there were so many puzzle pieces, and you know, the thing is, you'd uh, you'd work on it, and you'd find a clue, you'd follow up, you'd put a piece of the puzzle to, and that would just fuel the fire. You know, then it'd be like, okay, then okay, now, now this answers why this happened or this component, you know, uh, how do, you know, where, do, how do I go to the next thing? How do I, you know, and, you know, when we started, I mean, we sat down and had written a lengthy list of questions. You know, these are the questions, you know, questions that we'd, we would want to know that would seem like it would point us in the direction. And as, uh, you know, essentially, I drove across several states. I mean, following information, doing research, oh. um, viewing microfilm, all kinds of things, and basically compiled the. Which, to be honest, um, that part of it I found incredibly satisfying, and I I, I really this is enjoyed the personal it. interview part. Well, no, the 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 the, the part that was. Uh, Research, doing research, and mm -hmm. and you know looking up information and that kind of investigative stuff. That part, um, I, I liked very much because it was like putting a puzzle together, you know. And and uh, it, there wasn't any kind of kickback, you know, as far as uh, pushback. I guess is what I should say, yeah. kickback. But push like a, there was no uh, resistance. There was no. There was nobody to be angry at me. It's a microfilm machine, you know. <laughs> so that part I was like aces with, you know. Um, but and, and and I did enjoy the interview process as well. You know, the filming aspect of it and doing the interviews. Um, there was a, a one of the life lessons that I learned learned on this was that um, you know in my music career I've spent the last forty years trying to you know get people to like me, like my music, you know, want to come see me play. And I, I guess I started with a very naive frame of mind. My outlook on life was that if you're doing something for the right reasons, you know, everybody's going to welcome you with open arms and they're going to see that you're a good person and you're trying to do something for the good reasons. And I How found out. How'd that work out, out for you? What's that? <laughs> How'd that work out for you? Yeah, the, uh, it, the yeah. close, the deeper I got into the story, um, I mean, one of the things I had to realize right off the bat um, within the first couple of interviews was that I was perceived as a journalist, even though in my mind, I never thought of myself that way. You know, I'm just thinking, hey, I'm just making a film. I'm a filmmaker, you yeah, know. I'm a guitar player, singer-songwriter. Right. But because of the subject matter, it was, you're a journalist. Right. And then there was immediately a sort of, are you some kind of usurper? What are your motivations? Why are you why trying are you doing to, this? why are you well, digging around in this, this horrible yeah. thing, you know? And yeah, why are you bringing this up? It's been 25 years, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I mean, when we start, started, it was like 22, but, you know, Still, long been time. Been yeah. over 20 years. But, Leave it alone. And that was to part of the story, to be honest, was that that pain and trauma that happened to Manchester and Paula and Danby was still there. It was still there, but it did, like everything yeah. else, it had dissipated. And but by sure kind of were coming along and trying, you know, I mean, I know with with you, the day that I called you and said, "Hey, I'm working on this project and would like to talk to you about it." And as soon as I said her name, I heard you bristle on the phone, where you know you obviously were uncomfortable. Yeah, and. Um, well, and now it was an unsolved murder, and right. it makes people remember that we had an unsolved murder right. in Manchester. Right, and you know, for and that's tough to yeah. cope with, frankly. Well, and, and to, you, to be you, honest, uh, there were even people that were. Uh, I, I know that there was some um, some women that I interviewed that were nervous because they didn't know. Like, I, I had learned within the six months, first six months of the project, I had I had found information that pointed me toward the man that's now going to be charged with the homicide of Sarah and that would be David Allen Morrison. Right. And, and he is currently residing California in, in jail. California. Yes. In jail in California. Yes. And uh, but I, I within the first six months knew that he was that 
well, I shouldn't I shouldn't be so bold as to say that. I got to be careful. That uh, <laughs> I knew that allegedly he was the guy that I you in know, your mind he was the number one. He guy. seemed like uh, the most likely suspect. I had a lot of information and evidence pointing towards him within the first six months. But you know, I mean, at that point, his name was not out there in the public. You know, oh. nobody really knew about him. And um, so, like, for instance, with this, this one woman that I interviewed who, you know, when I first talked to her on the phone and asked her to interview, she said, well, there's, there's a murderer out there, and I, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with And I had to kind of say, um, I can assure you that you are safe, because I knew that he was in jail. Right. He wasn't going anywhere. Right. You know. And, um, but she didn't know that. Right. And so I, I did set her at I said, look, I... I, I can guarantee you that the person that you're worried about is in a position where he can't do anything to you. And um, she ended up doing the interview with me. But, um, oh. yeah. You know, uh, so, yes, just, there was me, a lot of learning. Let me just pause and reintroduce you. Um, for those of you who have just perhaps tuned in, I will encourage you to go back and watch the beginning of this show uh, <laughs> at a later time when it airs. Uh, my guest is Dwayne Carlton, longtime friend of mine. Uh, singer, songwriter, musician, uh, who has jumped out of his comfort zone hmm. and uh, done a documentary film. We should plug the name of the film, Overtaken by Darkness. Uh, it yeah. was uh, a miss in not mentioning the title of the film earlier. Yeah. Uh, Overtaken by Darkness. It's a, it's a documentary about the uh, disappearance and subsequent murder of Sarah Hunter, uh, formerly of Manchester, Vermont. She was the first woman golf pro of Manchester Country Club. Uh, and for all who knew her, a, a wonderful person uh, who uh, met with a, a horrible fate. Uh, also, it, in just in the last few weeks, uh, the name of uh, David Allen Morrison uh, has been alleged to uh, have been the person who perpetrated this crime. Uh, he is currently in prison in California, and there's is there a move afoot to... Uh, extradite him back here. Yeah, what uh, the basically at this point he's all but admitted that he's done it. I mean, he's made comments to the press. Um, oh, he has. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, that we're you know the very much implicated himself, mm -hmm. and um, he um, when the police about I don't know maybe six or eight weeks ago announced that they were going to charge him uh, with the crime. They said that they're going to extradite him back to Vermont within the next 90 days to uh, yeah. uh, stand trial, you know. Um, and then they said at that point, after the trial, he would be returned to California to finish out whatever sentence he had there. And then uh, when that sentence was complete, he would be returned to Vermont and, com and you know, do his time here. Here, yes. How long is he in jail in California for? Do he you know? was originally sentence 17 to life. He's been there for 24 years. Oh. So, um, you know, and I know that at the beginning of this year he had a parole hearing and I believe he gets them every three years, I think. And so my guess is that when he comes back here, whatever trial occurs here, he'll go back and then probably on his next parole hearing they'll grant him parole and then just ship him back to Vermont or somewhere on the East Coast. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, what's he in jail for out there, do you know? He <coughs> basically uh, abducted a woman at gunpoint um, at 4 in the morning and f uh, she was delivering newspapers. He abducted her at gunpoint in her own vehicle. Um, essentially was attempting to assault her while driving her, he was driving her vehicle, she jumped out of the car on the, free, you know, jumped out of the moving vehicle and got away, called the police. The police then chased him on, on the freeway. He ditched the car, jumped the wall, just trying to hide in the bushes, and they, and they caught him. This was in August of 1988. And 88, uh, two and years after yes, he killed Sarah Hunter. That's right. Allegedly and, killed Sarah Hunter. Right. And um, subsequently... Um, but he didn't kill this woman in California. Well, no, because she got away from him. So he's, it's straight-up kidnapping. A, a sexual assault. And sexual then assault. there was, a, you know, a weapon involved. He, 
you know, yeah. he stole her car. I yeah, mean, so he had enough There was stuff a slew of charges. And then uh, when they announced that he um, was being charged, you know, and, um, you know, because prior to this, if you tried to find information online about either Sarah Hunter or David Morrison, it was next to impossible. There was a few paragraphs about her on a couple of websites, but not much. Not much. And yeah. on him, I mean, I could find when his parole hearings were and where he was housed, but that was about it. Huh. Um, it, it came out that when he was, when they announced he was being charged, that apparently there also was a second uh, victim uh, that where that he had abducted and, and sexually assaulted in California, that they that he had also been charged and convicted of. So there was, I knew had about. He, had he killed anybody else that we're, that we're aware of? No, uh, we don't know. Well, that's a hard question. I. Not that he's <coughs> ever been convicted of. Or admitted to. Right. Uh, the thing is that he actually um, had had this uh, two prior, um, I guess, accusations of doing the same, same exact M.O. Uh. Um, once in Vermont, once in Massachusetts in 81, so five years prior to oh, gee. Sarah Hunter. Um, and had been acquitted in the Massachusetts case, and in Vermont the, case, the the charges were dropped against him. But both both of those girls told pretty much the exact same story, same kind of M.O., and it matched exactly what he did to these girls in California. Why do you suppose in this string of <coughs> abductions and sexual assaults that um, the one time, apparently, allegedly the one time he... Right opted to kill Sarah Hunter. Any any thoughts on that? I mean, I do. you don't have any proof as to, you know, why he would choose to uh, kill Sarah Hunter. Actually, did. that's not necessarily true. Okay. In, in the film, there is information about why that possibly occurred. Um, so I'm trying to think how I can say it without... Uh, um, I, I, it's in the film. I can say that, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But there, 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 there was, um, you know, f f he was known to uh, kind of hang out with girls that were younger than him, as a general rule. You know, yeah. And from what background history I've acquired about him, yeah. and in in the case of Sarah Hunter, um, I, I, you know, I, she was a woman that apparently had um, a lot of backbone. I'll say that. Ah, oh. okay. We get it. Um, well, let's go back to not quite the beginning, but you've decided to go forward with this project. You've invested in gear, yeah. <coughs> and you're going to do this. So uh, I've never done a documentary, and I'm going to guess that the majority of my viewers uh, have never done such a project. Uh, how do you start? Where do you start? How do you get people to talk to you? I mean, you're, you know, I was easy. I'm a friend of yours. Right. And you asked for, for some background, and uh, I I didn't have a problem with it. But if I didn't know you from right. Adam, and you came to me and said, I want to talk to you about the disappearance of, of Sarah Hunter, uh, first of all, I probably don't want to talk about that. And if I didn't really want to talk about that. Why would I want to talk about that with you? Right. Um, I have to think it was a bit of a challenge. It was, it was a bit of a challenge. And um, to be honest, I mean, I am by nature a person that avoids confrontational situations. And I'm not the kind of person that I, I don't in, ever intend to try to make somebody else feel bad or feel uncomfortable. Um, I don't like, you know, hurting other people's feelings or so. Um, that was one of the things I learned about myself is that. What's, what's the matter with you? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and I can't stress enough that um, one of the goals with this film, so kind of before I answer your question, I'm going to preface it with this, sure. is that I wanted from the very beginning to make a film that was not sensationalistic. It's, there's not 
shock value as far as you are not going to see shocking images in this film. Right. Because to <clears> me, <throat> again, it goes back to my, my whole intention was to be very respectful to the memory of Sarah Hunter. Even though I didn't know her personally, right. you know, I feel that, like I said, she was a very good person from everything that I've learned about her and that she deserves respect. You know, and she deserves to be known for those good things. And I not just another missing person right, murdered. And, and I did not want to make any kind of a film that was going to do anything but, you know, try to be respectful to her and her family. I I didn't want to cause any kind of emotional trauma to her family, to her friends. You know, and and um, you know. Well, it had to have been hard since you're going back and yes. kicking up dust on a yes. whole wound here. And, and to be honest, when we started it, the way the, the way that <clears throat> the way that I viewed it was, if you look, at, think about a, a target. You have like an outer band. Yeah. You have an inner band. Yeah. You have the bullseye. Yeah. I looked at it like the outer band. That's talking to people that lived in the area at the time that had peripheral knowledge about how you know the town was affected, things like that, like yeah. you. We, you know, that's that's where I started the out the outer band, and those people were generally like you know a little uneasy. But yeah. like I said, as long as I said, well, look, you're you're safe. I can promise you, you're safe. Yeah. Then okay, they were they were willing to talk, and then I I looked at the second band of of the target was the people that were more directly involved in the story. For instance, in the film, I interview. Uh, the two young men who were 10 and 12 at, at the time that found her purse in Danby. You know, they were little boys at the time. And, and uh, you know, but they were directly involved in that story. And they could tell exactly what they did that day, what happened that day. God, they were 10 and 12 years old. They were old. 10 and 12, yes. And, um, and, you know, and it was getting into that area, you know, and like I, it was, I still could get people to, t like with them, I had to do a lot of phone calls and a lot of, you know, pestering until, you know, I finally, um, like, well, it turns out, though, that. So you were just persistent with these folks. Some I of mean, them, and some of, and know. to be honest, some of them knew me as, as a musician. And in particular, the, like, one of and the they things. they liked you. Well, one of the things <laughs> about this is, I, I, gr I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fifth generation Vermonter. And, yeah. and it's like, to me, Vermont is like one big small town. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you probably, you know, you can't turn around in Vermont without running into somebody who's either knows somebody you know oh, or yeah. is related to related you in to some you. way, you yeah, know. Sure. And like in that, that particular instance, one, one of those uh, young men was friends with my nephew and had seen me play up at Stratton Mountain. Yeah. And he, you know, talked to his brother, and then that's how it happened. And, and some of it went that way. Did anybody flat out, no way, I'm not talking to you? Uh, there were people that I, I sent letters to that didn't respond. There were people that, yes, that said... Um, I don't want, I don't want, yeah, I don't want to talk Yeah, I don't... To. There were people that would talk to me and give me information not on privately, camera. But privately. Not, privately. Right. And... Um, but there were people that uh, that I did talk to that were just no, I, you know, and and that was another thing that that really was hard for me because there were people that I talked to who I was, you know, and and they even did give me some information, but I I made them uncomfortable and I that, that bothered me a yeah. lot because that's just not that who wasn't I am. what you were trying to do, right? You know, I'm you're not Mike Wallace I'm, on this stuff, right? I'm, yeah. I, you know, I, and. You know, like I say, it was a learning experience. I went, you know, this was probably not the first film I should have made. But once I'd, <laughs> once I'd gotten into it and I had Too all this that. footage shot, I, I felt like, well, I can't waste all those people's time. You know, you, you, I, we spent hours at your house, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I couldn't, in, a, in good oh, conscience. Oh, the set up, the whole yeah. lighting and the yeah. sound, and it was, I mean, a, it, it was an it, operation, no right. question about it. And I was thinking about, boy, how many people are you talking to? This is quite a, quite a production. Yeah, you know, and um, you know, by the end of it, I was doing that all myself, doing all the setup, doing the sound, oh doing the camera, doing the interview, <laughs> and uh, but I felt like you know these people gave of themselves and they gave their time and they felt the way I felt that this 
This deserves to go forward, and this deser she deserves justice. And they participated, and I, in good, good conscience, could not waste their time. I had to. I was driven to finish it. Finish it. Yeah. And, and to be honest, it was, I had never given really a thought about what am I going to do with it when it's done. It was like, I just need to get it finished so that I followed through on what I told those people I was going to do. And it happened that I finished the film on a Thursday, or like a Wednesday. I finished the final edit of it, watched it. That weekend went by, and that Monday morning they announced that they were going to charge Morrison with the crime. And Did you that see that coming? No. Never saw it coming? No. I believe I sent you that article. Uh, a bunch of people. It, like, I had phone calls <laughs> ringing off the wall that day did. on my answering yeah. machine because, uh, but to be honest, actually what happened was uh, my, my wife gets up for work very early, and uh, I was sleeping, and she saw the 6 o'clock news that morning. Uh, on that Monday morning, and she came in, and you know, and I had played until four in the morning that night. <laughs> so you know, I was on two hours of sleep or whatever. And she goes, uh, "They just announced they're going to have a press release about Sarah Hunter." And I knew right then they're not going to have a press release for nothing. No, no, you know, press no. conference. So yeah. I, I basically got up on two hours of sleep and waited until they did the the press conference and watched it and uh, you know and started getting information off the internet and then people were calling me and you were emailing me and other people emailed me and wow. which I thought was great that there were people that uh, you know wanted to to, to send See the information through, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but you know it it was very hard because like I say I'm not a confrontational person but the people that that interviewed with me really did like I say gave of themselves and they gave you know honest recollections to the best of their ability exactly the way they, you know, how they remembered it happened. There's a wealth of information in this film. That I, I can guarantee that some, anybody who watches this film, there is a thousand times more information available in this film than there ever was to the public. I guarantee you that. Yeah, that that's true. I mean, I've, I've seen this and it's, there's a lot more in this movie then I mean it's a compilation of the information that uh, the overwhelming majority of the information in this film has never been released yeah. uh, um, so y you obviously had to deal with authorities <laughs> with with uh, presumably newspapers a lot of information mm -hmm. came from the newspapers but there's there's public information which is what you would have gotten from newspapers but then there's the other information. Uh, well, how, how technically everything I got was public information. It's just okay. whether it should have been or shouldn't have been is okay. the question. Okay. You know, um, uh, like you say, I mean, where we, where I started was, I mean, I started right here in Manchester. You know, the first day, I'm I'm going to start doing. Yeah, right I went. Here. Who was your first? Who was the first person you spoke to? Linda Spence. Okay. Town because, clerk. Town clerk. Yeah. Because I came here looking for Sarah Hunter's death certificate. Okay. Which wasn't here. What? It is now because I brought it here, but it, it wasn't at the where time. Where was it? Well, actually, it makes sense. It was actually in Paulette where she was found. I, I see. So, you know. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, Linda actually called around to uh, some of the outlying towns, located it for me. Yeah. I drove out there. Picked it up. And, um, yeah, and picked it up and actually brought a copy back to Manchester. And, um, Public service. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I'm a do-gooder. That's what that's what I want you to you know to see here. You know, that's the idea. But um, but yeah, you know, I um, it, then it was a lot of 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 going and searching through newspaper um, archives, and and some of that was really hard because uh, that's something that because of uh, the decline of the newspaper industry with you know with the whole internet thing, uh, sure. archivists aren't employed there anymore. Right. Um, so, I mean, it was, uh, you know, I had to go to a lot of public libraries and do the microfilm thing and, and print out, you know, articles. And, I mean, I have a vast collection of newspaper articles on this subject, you know. But then you go through that and you start reading between the lines what people are saying, what they're not saying, how they said what they said. And, you know, and, you, right. and you, then you start going from there. Um, and, you know, what kind of blew it open for me was that I actually did find a clue in a place where, unless you were looking for it, you would never have found it. 
Can you talk about it? I read a book about a, uh, about a certain case that actually mentioned, not specifically, but mentioned this case. Wow. And, but not by name. But when I read but it, you I went, figured it out I was like, it has to be this case. This case. And that kind of led me to find some information that um, that's how I ended up finding about, out about, you know, David Morrison originally. And um, when did you, you, knew, you said early in this conversation that you knew of David Morrison and felt that he was the culprit early on? Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say that I felt that he was the culprit, but I, I felt that he was an ex. I mean, because I, I'm, I don't want to like do anything um, illegally by saying what my own personal feelings were. Yeah, yeah. But he, you know, he certainly was a suspect. The number one suspect in my mind. He was. And I knew about him. I knew about him before I interviewed you, and you were one of the first people I interviewed. Hmm. And you know, I mean, I don't want to compromise anybody here, and I don't want to get anybody out on a limb or whatnot, but. This murder has gone unresolved. Eighty-six, ninety-six. I mean, you know, twenty-five years. Twenty-six. Uh, Twenty-six years. Yeah. Uh, um, do you have any thoughts as to uh, why that took so long? I mean, you know, just all of a sudden, just just when you're wrapping up a four-year <laughs> project, yeah. you're waiting for one document from California. Yeah. Well, which was his his mugshot. You're just waiting for a mugshot, and you're all done with yeah. your project. Yeah. And that Monday, uh, the authorities announced that they uh, he is the alleged uh, perpetrator of this crime. Right. right. Uh, that seemed like kind of a coincidence. Maybe, you know, maybe. I mean, you've been digging on this story for four years. It's it's basically a a cold case, a dead file, mm -hmm. nothing appears to be happening uh, until some there's a lot crazy of musician comes out of West Rutland <laughs> yeah. and starts asking a lot of questions. Yeah. I mean, you're kicking, you're kicking dust up on an old case. Right. Which, again, I would like to reiterate, I was not trying to, like, you no, know, I, I, tear I was, the Band-Aid off an old wound here, and, and I wasn't really, I wasn't right. trying you to muck You were interested or, in the story. It's I, an interesting story. It's a mystery. Well, like I said, if it was my sister, I'd want it solved. You'd want it solved, and, and, you, and you want to do right by the victim, right. uh, all and, of and, that. And I felt that by, you know, hey, worst case scenario, you make a documentary film and put it out to the public. Yeah. It brings that subject back to the front of people's minds, and maybe... It kickstarts something. Maybe, you know, if all the stars align properly, you do find some new information, and it helps the case to go forward. Yeah. That's how I viewed it. And there's a lot of elements that went into why did it take so long. I mean, one of the things that we kind of forget about now in this era of forensic science and, and whatnot was 1986. DNA wasn't. There was no DNA. There was, yeah. yeah. It was. It had just. Is that been, and that's how they nailed this guy was on DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Mitochondrial DNA, which there have been advances in the past five six years in that, but I mean mitochondrial DNA has been around for you know probably the last ten or twelve years something like that, but um, I mean uh, DNA was not used in you know accepted in court used in you know right. until like right. ninety. Two or ninety four. Yeah, I think it's ninety two. I think, and uh, so you know that that wasn't part of this story at the beginning. But let's say uh, the DNA could have been used in the last ten years. I mean, do you do you think that? I mean, I know where you're I, trying to go. With I the know question. where I'm going with this, and I, 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 I cut to it. I mean, if you know, if I'm in if I'm in the uh, judicial and enforcement system in the state of Vermont, I have limited resources. I think it's this guy, uh, but I don't have the resources right now at my at my disposal to go out and do this. And, I mean, the guy's already in jail. He's going to rot in jail in California. Mm -hmm. Leave him there. Mm -hmm. The heck with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's him. I'm leaving him there. End of story. Yeah. Uh, um, until until this initiative comes forward and and. It, I, you know, I, I'm guessing the authorities didn't know where the film was going to go, but probably in the back of their head, they probably said, this guy's going to figure this out. 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, wonder I, if we should we should pursue this. I'll say straight up that I would never be so bold as to say that what I was doing had anything to do with, you know, uh, there's no way any that I would ever know that even if it did occur. Yeah. And if it did occur, there's probably not much more that I'd be as proud of because that was, you know, I just sure, really well, felt that this, you know, but well, the end I game would for never, everybody was to nail the guy. Right, and I couldn't be happier that they're going to. <clears throat> yeah, um, perfect. And, yeah, but, uh, you know, as far as I, I would never assume to take any kind of credit in that regard. I mean, there was, I definitely made my presence known to the investigators who had worked on, this, on the case at the time. Yeah. Are I they all retired now? Yes. Yeah. And I definitely, for better or worse, let them know what I knew, how much I knew. I was completely upfront and honest with them yeah. because, like I said before, I'm very naive, idealistic. I'm thinking, you know, we're all wearing the white hats here. We're all on the same team, and you know. But I, I learned a lot of lessons, and one of them is, I, I'm not on the, I'm not thought of as on the team. You know, it's yeah. like the team is the team, and uh, you know. Yeah, you're just doing the story. Right. So. Um, you know, I but I did make my presence known. There were a lot of things that I did behind this, uh, you know, because I, I did want to see the case go forward. Um, I did. So you I'd must be happy in that regard. That I'm been, ecstatic. Yeah. I'm I mean, ecstatic. after all this time and all this effort and yeah. work that you put into this. Uh, well, and the, I'm really ecstatic the, that when they announced who they were going to charge, that it was the guy that I'd spent four years working that uh, working think, on a film of, about, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. Because that would have been a, that would have been quite a blow to have, uh, have done it be all the somebody thousands of hours of work and, and have you uh, be totally wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would that would hurt. But um, you know, like I say, there was a lot of things I did behind the scenes. I mean, I did I did write letters to Morrison, you know, trying to get him you to did, talk oh, to so me. Oh, so you did communicate with this guy? Uh, he did not communicate back. I made every effort to. I made several attempts to. You know, I wrote letters to him on a number of occasions. Wow. I could not get him to write back to me. Um, I also. You know, uh, one of the things you mentioned was, well, you know, if he's in jail already on somebody else's dime, what's the motivation yeah. for us to spend resources right. to? And, you know, is, uh, again, I was naive about that, but there's, th you know, that's, that may be the, you know, how things go, you know. And um, I thought that maybe that's the way it was, too, and I, I contacted the state's attorney's office and asked, um, someone there, you know, the question that, well, if it's a case of just funding, and we're talking at, about DNA testing on old evidence, we're not talking that much money in the grand scheme of things, a couple of thousand bucks maybe. I said, I got a credit card, I'll slap it down. Could, could a private citizen pay for that testing to be oh. done? To which the answer was, I can't give you a legal reason why it couldn't, why you couldn't, but you're going to have to ask the district attorney. And so I contacted the district attorney and basically got the same answer, except it's the Vermont State Police's evidence. You're going to have to ask them. So I, asked the, uh, so I contacted the Vermont State Police, and they made it clear that they did not want to have any dealings with any documentary film or filmmaker or anything along those lines. You know, and uh, I also contacted uh, the New Hampshire um, cold case squad, which formed in the last couple of years. And because uh, my thoughts were maybe that there were, you know, cases, unsolved, you know, um, abductions and assaults that this person could have perpetrated back in the early to mid 80s. In New Hampshire. In New sure. Hampshire. Yeah. Because, you know, it went, <clears throat> if you look at the crime that he was charged with in Massachusetts. Well, there was abductions on 91 and... Yeah, and well, right. There were crimes on that side of the state that were similar. Well, yeah, except yeah. that the, the way that the, the women were killed was different, yeah. and, you know. Um, yeah. But, um, but uh, like I say, if you looked at the crime that he had been accused of in Massachusetts and you looked, it took a straight line down and it was like 40 miles. Well, if you used where this guy lived as the center of a circle and drew a 40-mile circumference around that, Right, it covered all the way over to the North Way. It covered up to Route Four. It covered oh, Mile wow. Three. It covered yeah, Ninety One. Yeah. It covered yeah, Route yeah, Nine. Yeah. It covered. I mean, there was all these major roadways. Okay, so I thought, well, you know, 
maybe he's done this in other places and there was evidence that could be compared to the evidence you know even though you know a 25 or 30 year old rape case you could never prosecute him on but if that evidence still existed it could be compared to this evidence and if sure. you could prove that he did this and this evidence matched this you could prove that he did that wow. and i talked to the new hampshire uh, a, a police officer in new hampshire and got the answer that well, why would we spend the money to test old evidence when we can't prosecute him? Right. So it wasn't about, men, right. you know what I mean? So right. I, it was a little disheartening. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, Oh, I'm sure the, you know, the I levels did, of frustration were, must have been pretty high. Yeah. About the whole process. Um, so, you know, there were those kind of things. But like I say, I would never be so presumptuous as to take any kind of credit. I, you know, like I said, all I ever wanted to do was maybe shine light on the subject. And if that in, in, in and of itself would be enough to get people thinking about it and maybe thinking about new ways to solve it, then that's all I ever wanted in the we beginning. We have just a little bit of time left, so let's go to something that's probably not quite so controversial, <laughs> uh, which is the release. Yes. Uh, you are scheduled, as, as you noticed in the trailer that we showed earlier, uh, on September 18th, on the anniversary of her disappearance, uh, you will be releasing this film uh, at the theater in... Uh, the, the, West, the town hall theater in West Rutland, Vermont? Yes. Yeah. At what time? Uh, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Um, Tickets are 5 bucks, 6, six bucks? 6, six bucks. bucks. Um, you cheap. can get them at the town hall. Yeah. You can get them from me, any place that I'm playing. Uh, DwayneCarlton.com. And at DwayneCarlton.com. <laughs> and Carlton is C-A-R-L-E-T-O-N. -E -E yeah. Dot com. Yep. And uh, uh, you can actually buy the tickets straight there online. Yeah. Uh, and you can also watch the trailer again. You if can you watch the trailer on your website. Uh, uh, can we? Are, are you looking? Are you, are you trying to distribute this elsewhere? I'm, you know, as I said before, you know, I had focused so much on just getting it done. I had no <laughs> plan, and then things just no exploded because you know I thought you know I got all the time in the world because this guy's not getting charged he's not and then all he's never going to be charged and yeah so yeah. now all of a sudden you're yeah. in rapid mode yeah. yeah and um you know it's it's in the works you know I mean I to be honest I don't I don't know because um you know I, I I'm hoping that it's well received like I said my no, goal it's a, no is it's a it's a feature film it's an hour and 25 minutes yeah hour and 30 minutes it's full length yeah it's a full length film uh it's it's no joke the uh, subject matter is no joke. Right. It's a genuine documentary, and, mm -hmm. and I have seen uh, the film and certainly parts of it. I watched the trailer just earlier today. It's unbelievably professional. Thank Great you. sound. Thank you. Uh, very well done and, and very informative. And you will, you, the public, will get to learn uh, as much as absolutely possible about what happened here in Manchester, Vermont, in, in 19 and Danby and Paulet mm -hmm. in 1986, um, I would very much encourage you to, uh, if you can, hop in the car and drive to West Rutland on September 18th, the town hall, and hopefully, uh, you know, I've encouraged you, and maybe this will help that uh, perhaps. Vermont Public TV might pick it up or yeah. some uh, I've channel. I've actually been in contact with them yeah. and have submitted the film to them and I'm just uh, now waiting to hear back from Great. them. Great. Great. And I've looked into a couple of other, you know, TV channels. There's a lot of channels out there now now that deal with true crime and things sure. like that. Uh, the documentary film channel and uh, so uh, yep. so I've I've been doing some, you know, homework yeah. on that. And um, you know, right now it's just my focus is just premiering it. And, uh, you know, uh, to be honest, I'm terrified. This is out of my comfort zone. Um, I'm really not looking to upset people. And so I, I'm oh, terrified. I, I, you know? I, I don't think this, I, I've seen this film. This film won't upset people. It is very informative. It is going back and opening uh, an old case, yeah. uh, which is now uh, allegedly solved, if yeah. you will. Uh, or close. Or close. Yeah. Um, but, uh, my, my thoughts. What, what you wanted to do was a service, and I, th I think right. that, the film that I've seen uh, really does a service to uh, the victim, to the victim's family, and to our community and to our state. Uh, and just from the just unbelievable amount of work that you put into this and the results that you got out of it, uh, it, it is a it's a beautiful film. It really is. It's a, it's a great piece of work. 
So the question I have is that you said uh, earlier in our interview that uh, if if you were going to do such a thing, this wouldn't have been your first film. Yeah. But it is your first film. Yeah. So what's your second film? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to keep doing films because I do enjoy, you know, making. I did. I did. Overall, my experience was was good, other than the intensity of this. And I've probably learned enough lessons in this that I I would. I'm not going to jump into doing another uh, kind of murder mystery anytime soon. Although yeah. there are, I can think of there's at least a couple. <laughs> th there's at least one or two that I yeah. find very intriguing. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, you know, I've thought of uh, I've got a lot of ideas. I mean, uh, one of them is um, I'd like to do a film about illegal downloading. You know, which is something that I've you know, uh, got some personal connection to as a musician and just how public perceptions about what, is, is it stealing to download music sure. legally or not or, yeah. you know, you know, and so I thought that'd be kind of an interesting film. Um, you know, my brother-in-law has a family farm that's been in his family for generations and uh, to me there's a great story there of, you know, and, and now he's got sons that are going to be taking over the farm and, you know, yeah. they're all working on it together and it's, to me, there's there's great heroism and tragedy and just you know strength sure. of character, you know, uh, the, it's a great st that would be a great story. No to intentions tell. on giving up the music business. No, you know, I. I Phew. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and For and all I, your fan base out there over the last forty <laughs> years, they would be shocked to hear that you were going to give up music. Uh, no, I actually am uh, also pursuing um, the possibility of. Uh, I'm about to submit a, uh, a video review, uh, gear review, to, uh, I have a buddy that works at American Music, Music Supply, which is the, one of the big uh, catalog companies, mm. and um, they're thinking about doing some, on, you know, having online reviews, and uh, so I might actually be, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit, I'm going to do shoot a review and, and submit it, and hopefully I'll be the guy that they have doing uh, online reviews. You Terrific. Know? So I get to combine both of my kind of passions. And wow. Yeah. Uh, Dwayne Carlton, it's great to have you back on my show. It's uh, it's intriguing as all get out to have you on the show and just barely talk about music. Uh, uh, the film, ladies and gentlemen, is overtaken by darkness. Uh, it's the story of the disappearance and subsequent murder of Sarah Hunter, uh, former resident of Manchester, Vermont. Um, it'll uh, be screened for the first time to the public September 18th in West Rutland, Vermont at the Town Hall Theater. Tickets are six bucks. Go to Dwayne Carlton, Carlton with an E, C-A-R-L-E-T-O-N, mm -hmm. DwayneCarlton.com. Uh, get a ticket, go see this film. It's, uh, I even if you have no connection to this case at all, it's an extraordinary piece of work, uh, very well done, and uh, done by a great guy. Dwayne, thanks very much thank for being you. on the show. Thank you, Bob, thank uh, you for having me. This is me. a great project, and uh, I wish you all the success with it. And uh, Folks, I want to thank you again for tuning in to uh, Q&A Live, uh, and I very much look forward to seeing you on my next show. See you next time.